start by introducing themselves and maybe giving us a little story. How about that? We have to share. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead start. As curious George would, we'll share. <laughs> How do you do? Um, I'm Dave Foster, and as the story said, I was one of the kids in Waterville that were, like the three of us that were really in Waterville when the race arrived. And so we had a long, long time together. Um, you know, as far as stories go, Boy, one is kind of a cheesy story, but still <laughs> one of my favorites. So I mean, I think it typifies particularly Hans Ray, who, as I said, was a very good friend. Um, <clears throat> there was an old inn in Waterville, charming old inn. And what was very much a routine of, every, of most mornings in the summer would be that. Uh, People that were in their cottages and uh, guests of the inn would kind of congregate in the front and just have the social hour. Uh, the men would force them up for golf, uh, cocktail parties were arranged, and just the time that they got together every day. And uh, I had been up early and I was exploring my valley. And I had. Um, I caught a frog in the frog pond, um, which I was quite proud of. And uh, I had him in a pocket. And I, uh, everybody was over by the inn, and I went over, and Hans was there. And I showed him my frog. I wanted to show Hans my frog. He was very much a naturalist, and many other things. And, uh, he admired my frog and kind of stepped away from the men, who I'm sure were, they were having much more interesting talk than you would have with a, a five-year-old boy in a crew cut and a dirty shirt and wet sneakers. And um, we talked about it just a bit. And then he said, well, what are you going to do with the frog now? And I said, well, I'm going to bring him home. And I'm going to keep him up in my room with my hat. <laughs> and I said, well, now, how would you feel <laughs> if, a, if a big ogre came into your house <laughs> and took you out of your room, away from your family, away from everything that was familiar, and um, brought you to his house and kept you in his room? And um, I kind of knew where this was going. <laughs> and um, so I said, okay, I'll let him go. And I set off to let the frog go. And I got it not too far away. And Hans again stepped away from the, the older man and said, hey, just a minute. I'll walk with you. And he. Um, walked with me a long ways, all the way across the valley to the pond. And we talked about things, you know, the circle of life things and whatever. And with some ceremony said um, goodbye to the frog and let him go. Um, I really think that was, you know, Hans Ray in his truest form, that he gravitated just to kids, that he was so much more than that. But if he would take the time just to tell a little boy that, you know, he had really a better thing to do. I'm Susan Scrimshaw. And there are actually five siblings, so my brother Nick will speak for himself. But one of the other uh, children who speaks in the film is our youngest brother, Nat. Uh, Nat's the one who wrote the poem and was then so, so crushed. Um, we, we were living, uh, our family's been in Waterville 
for generations is a summer place. We've been very lucky. But we were living in Guatemala. My father was working for the United Nations. So we came up from Guatemala on home leave, and that was the first time that we met the Rays. We always called him Mr. Ray. And so one of my memories was that he, he spoke a lot of languages, and uh, he spoke Portuguese, and so he would get, go in with us with Spanish. And you know, he, un he understood the, this multicultural thing that we had. It was a little bit of a shock to come to the States um, when you hadn't seen it since you were three. Um, so he was, he was wonderful that way. Um, but my, my, um, one of the things that was not put in the film that was one of our happy memories, and my, our youngest brother, Nat, is now carrying on that tradition, was that um, Mr. Ray would do chalk talks. He would frequently, in the Waterville Inn usually, in the, it was in the lobby, wasn't it? I'm trying to, trying to remember room. this, in the music, the music room. He would get um, big, I, I still can't think of it in English, in Spanish, it's about big, on this big paper, you know, and he would say, um, I saw a bear today. I saw a mother bear with her cubs, and he'd start drawing them, and he'd tell the story of his walk or his adventure. He might have drawn your frog that day. And then he'd also ask kids um, to name a letter or to give them the letter of their name, and he'd put that up on and would then make an animal out of their name. And you would get these pictures. He'd, he'd tear them off and give them away to the kids. So our brother, Steve, uh, has some that he gave to the Gray Center, I believe. Uh, but my brother Nat now goes, uh, he's worked with uh, Lely, who you saw in the film, um, and was inspired to draw in the style of Mr. Ray. So he will give chalk talks. He goes to children's, particularly uh, children's wards and hospitals, and he goes to schools and, uh, and, and throughout this region and does chalk talks. And I know he would have loved to have been here today, but I, like Mr. Ray, he loved the animals, and he's in Costa Rica building a land bridge for animals to be able to migrate um, from the cloud forest down, down to the ocean. Uh, so he really, I think all of us were inspired by the Rays in different ways. Um, but I, I wanted to share the story of the Chalk Talks because I don't know why they didn't make it into the film, because they meant so much to us. So, Nick, over to you. Well, there is one um, picture in the film where you noticed he was drawing with both hands. <coughs> and that's my memory, and I was always amazed yeah, as a child. One thing that isn't, doesn't come out in the um, <coughs> documentary is how small Waterville was. It was just an old inn, 12 cottages, one of them my great-grandfather's, and a, in the 50s, a scattering of vacation and ski homes started being built. But there was no stores, no, it was just the inn, 12 houses, and not 24. too many kids. 24? Yeah, they were on both sides. Okay. Uh, <laughs> she's older, she has better memories than I have. <laughs> um, But it was such a, a beautiful community um, where we really got to know them well. And in, you know, running down in the afternoon, see, is that sign that Margaret put up there? No! <laughs> knock, knock, knock. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing, I just learned this a few days ago from my sister, and I think you can corroborate, is that um, why did Hans and Margaret come to New Hampshire? And it turns out, you know the story better than I do, was the New York Times. In 1952, Waterville had something like seven or nine voters, and they all got together at midnight, and were the first in the nation to vote. And it made the New York Times. And evidently, Hans and Margaret said, wow, that's, a, must be a good place to write. <laughs> so, um, I'll just say is that Hans always treated me with dignity. He would listen to me, and he would be utterly honest. He wasn't, you just felt here was another human being. And I think that the innate curiosity, which I've tried to keep throughout my career, um, and the caring for students, uh, has really been inspired 
uh, by Hans. And Margaret. <laughs> um, she was always gracious to us. And I'm choosing my words carefully. <laughs> um, but if you have any questions or anything else to share, please. Yeah, we have a lot of memories, so go ahead. Yes. Uh, I associate Waterville Valley now with mountain climbing. Mm -hmm. uh, was it in those days did people climb any of those mountains like the Kumsa? Oh, we climb all the time. I mean, you may want to talk about that. But yes, our our great grandfather built a lot of the trails, oh, did really? a lot of the trail work, but the the Rays didn't climb. <laughs> Yes, different times in the valley. And certainly, uh, people know the, <laughs> the history of the valley, and specifically the... Your great-grandmother. Um, and the history of, of Waterville. You know, tramping, climbing was just a huge um, recreation undertaking in there. And certainly Waterville being surrounded by mountains, it was you know, a very, that was, and not much else to do up there maybe, but that was an extremely popular um, place to go so you can spend some time with your family but still hike. Um, as a matter of fact, and this is, don't let me go off on tangents, don't let me go off on tangents. <laughs> but shortly after the war, um, the 10th Mountain Division of World War II used to come to Waterville with their families for reunions, principally so they could climb together. And they would, um, they would climb, spend time with their family, and then get together in what was referred to as the elbow room, the, um, the bar in the, in the inn, to um, maybe reminisce a little bit, but, and this is a point of interest and not taking too long, but enough, several of those men, more than several, were just added. Remember all the, the Seventh Mountain Division was recruited from the Dartmouth Ski Team. And so they had some grounds in Waterville, or in New Hampshire, really, not Waterville. And, um, but they love the outdoors. They just love the outdoors and they love skiing. And I can think of three, and I think there are more, but I can specifically speak to three that went on in skiing and developed, well, Aspen, Squaw Valley, and Vail. And those ideas were generated in the upper world. So, to answer your question. Yes, there's a long, long history of hiking in Waterville. Long tradition, in fact, on that, I mean, it was your, your family, it was your grandmother who ran the inn, but um, our, my brother now is named after my great uncle now, my grandfather's brother, who was the librarian in Dartmouth forever, and he helped start the Dartmouth Outing Club and brought them to Waterville for the hiking and for some of the skiing. They climbed Tecumseh with the skis on their back. And, and ski down, and so he has he has accounts of that. And um, our grandmother came from Hingham, Mass. Uh, she met my my grandfather at Woods Hole, and so she'd never been in the mountains. So he brought her to Waterville Valley, and she had to climb all the mountains in the valley before he married her. <laughs> so yes, it was a big I have no memory of the Rays doing any climbing. They uh, Mr. Ray would take walks. Um, but I, they, I don't think they climb mountains. No. Um, I was trying to think, oh, the other thing that there's only a little of in the film, that we probably all three of us remember, is the uh, telescope, which we have somewhere, don't we? Yes, yeah, sure. we have this telescope. You would take it out into the middle of the golf course, and then you saw in the film all the kids clustered around. But he taught us astronomy, and well, those were wonderful things. Man, just a real quick expand on that one. As I think you saw in the book, Han, Hans's book, The Stars Find the Constellation, which he wrote, I think, in 1953, maybe? 
and uh, in the early mid fifties, and as Sue says, you know, nineteen fifty two. Sorry. Okay. Um, good. Thank you. <laughs> and um, and it, it was uh, everybody in the valley knew there. This was a, a very interesting book because, as they said, you rewritten the constellations so they're more identifiable. Um, however, what's probably an interesting sidebar to this story is Hans's book, The Stars, since 1950, mid 50s, was required reading by every cadet at the United States Naval Academy as their precursor. Celestial Navigation <laughs> and many other organizations, and ultimately his star chart, maybe not the book, actually went into space. So that's more than just a little children's book, or at least thank the children for letting us use it. It didn't seem to make it into the movie, but I believe that Margaret, at least, and probably Hans, too, lived in Cambridge in yes. their later years. And the Chinese lady who shows up several times and has lots of comments and commentary became their executor, actually. Yes. Uh, she makes the statement in the movie that she'll take care of your... And one of the tasks that she had as executor was to bundle up everything that they had, all of those uh, day books that we saw and the manuscripts, and they were all shipped to the University of Southern Mississippi, uh, which may seem a little strange, except that one of the preeminent children's literature collections in the country is in Hattiesburg at the University of Southern Mississippi. And so if any of you are so inclined to do some more research and write another book, head south. <laughs> yes, they, they did move to Cambridge, and I think part of it was to be closer to Waterville, and part of it was that they, they liked Cambridge, so they lived there a long time. And yes, Lee Lake was their executor, and that's how our youngest brother got permission. I should mention that there's another brother here, Norman. Norman, you should just wave. Yeah, Norman's here. Uh, we, uh, we moved back to the States in 61, and so we... We all had a lot more time with the Rays, but um, uh, the, the Cambridge was very much part of it. So. Are, there, are there other questions? Yeah. You ever mentioned, did you ever put both the man and the yellow hat? Yeah. <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> We're trying to find out. Yeah. But I would like to say one more thing. Um, Margaret was fiercely articulate with many strong opinions. But I can't imagine Hans without Margaret, and Margaret without Hans. They were just 